Well, it's a real pleasure to be here. I mean, obviously, I've heard of the Oxford Union as the scene for many vigorous debates. And uh, there won't be much of a debate today, but let's hope that there'll at least be an interesting discussion on how one goes about um, developing a career. So I was asked to sort of give a personal story and with the idea that it might stimulate some discussion about you know, how uh, careers can develop and sort of the randomness of things, as I like to call it. So, you know, I, I'm reminded of Alice in Wonderland where the white knight or somebody tells Alice, begin at the beginning, then go on till the end, and then stop. And that's what I'll do. And most people have trouble with the then stop part. And uh, I'll, I'll try and make sure I do. Um, <clears throat> so I was born in South India. India is a little bit like the European Union. It's a conglomeration of uh, sort of nations with different languages and uh, different histories that have somehow come together to form uh, a country. Uh, they, of course, have many things in common, but they have different languages. And when I was three, my parents moved from the south of India, where they speak Tamil, uh, to the sort of western part of India, where they speak Gujarati. If you've heard of Patels in Britain, they're all Gujarati, uh, either directly or indirectly through East Africa. Now, my, one of my earliest memories is standing at a playground and not knowing uh, a thing about what the other kids were talking about. Uh, and that's sort of a feeling of being an outsider. And to some extent, I've had that feeling throughout my life because I've had to wander uh, all over the world uh, in, uh, during my career. Now, I stayed in Gujarat until I was 19, except for two years when I, or a year and a half, when I spent in Australia, in Adelaide, Australia. But when I was 19, I had graduated uh, from university in physics, and I wanted to uh, do a PhD in physics. And by the time I had graduated from university, uh, most Indians looked to the US for further studies. In my father's generation, uh, they nearly always wanted to go to the UK. But by then, uh, the focus had already shifted. And one of my roles is to shift the focus back to the UK, because I think um, you know, the UK actually is a wonderful place in which to do science and further studies. But any, in any case, I went to the only university at the time that would accept me without um, taking the GRE and yet offer me a fellowship. And that was a small uh, university in southeastern Ohio called Ohio University. Uh, its faculty had gone to very good uh, universities for their own degrees. And uh, so I was delighted to have the opportunity to go off to the US and uh, go and f sort of explore and find myself in a, in a way. Now, after my coursework and uh, you know, starting research, I very quickly realized I wasn't really cut out to be a physicist. There are all sorts of issues. First of all, I didn't even know what, what sort of questions, how to phrase the questions uh, you know, in order to work on them. Uh, and you know, I was doing theoretical physics, uh, which probably, in my case, was a mistake. And uh, so I, I realized, after a couple of years of this, that I would end up doing a bunch of boring second-rate calculations and never actually make the big breakthroughs. Now, around this time, I also was reading uh, you know, magazines like Scientific American. And I realized that almost every issue contained big breakthroughs in biology. You know, it was a time when DNA sequencing had just been developed and, you know, people were understanding what the immune system was, was like, you know, how antibodies were generated, um, how signaling molecules worked. I mean, there were just huge discoveries. In fact, protein structures, you know, how these large molecules inside cells even looked. Uh, that was being discovered. And so I thought, well, you know, maybe I should start all over again. And I knew that 
very famous biologists had started off as physicists, for example, Max Delbroek or Francis Crick. And I should say, around this time, I'd lost so, you know, so much interest in my studies that I mainly played on the university chess team and you know, went sort of hitchhiking and things like that. And I, I often joked that if I had a graduate student like me, I'd fire him you know, or her. So, um, so that was the situation. So what I did, and around this time, I also met my uh, wife. And so, uh, and I got married and she was, uh, she already had a daughter from a previous marriage. And I realized now that I had a sort of, you know, automatically had a family. Uh, I needed to uh, get on the ball and I couldn't just be wasting time. And so I buckled down and finished my PhD. It was a very unremarkable thesis. I think it has fewer than 20 references after, you know, 35 years or something. So it, it, it would have gone, I mean, it's essentially gone completely unnoticed. But the moment that I um, s decided to stop doing physics, I applied to graduate schools in biology. And when I did this, I got a sort of bimodal set of reactions. Some universities said, well, you know, sorry, you already have a PhD, so we can't accept you to graduate school, you know, to do another PhD. Uh, among these, one of them was a, a letter from Yale which said, we can't accept you as a graduate student, but you know, I'll send your CV around. Maybe some of our faculty would like to hire you as a postdoc uh, because they might want a postdoc who's trained in physics. And I actually got two letters. And the irony is one of those letters was from a guy named Tom Stites, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize later. But in the end, I, I declined them because I felt I didn't know any biology. So I didn't want to go and be a postdoc in a biology lab and just learn a very narrow slice of biology. And uh, that would just, you know, then that's all I would know. I, would, I wouldn't have a proper background. So I ended up going to UCSD where they agreed to take me as a grad student. And I stayed there in the first year I did, took a whole bunch of undergrad courses. This, you, might be, you might call this remedial biology because I didn't know any biology, so I took genetics, biochemistry, cell biology, and I was competing with a bunch of pre-meds who wanted to know whether they got 97 or 99. They, that made a big difference to them, and I was just there to learn, okay? So I didn't care what my uh, grades were, but they were all keen on getting into med school, which in America is a postgraduate uh, thing. So after a year of that, I did a, and, and I did a bunch of lab rotations, which had some hilarious things because I was doing experimental work for the first time. And the sort of things people assume you know, like having to use tips with these micropipetters, you know, uh, was something I didn't, I didn't even know there were tips. And I plunged this micropipetter into a radioactive solution and the technician just screamed at me because she had forgotten to tell me about tips, okay? And so, uh, so, so there were, Lots of interesting things like that in making this transition from being a theoretical physicist to an experimental uh, biologist. But after about a year of, about two years of this, I realized I'd actually learned quite a lot of biology. I knew how to do lab work, etc. And I thought, why do I need a second PhD? I don't really need a second PhD. And so then I wrote, so then I saw an article in Scientific American about using a physical technique called neutron scattering uh, to study a, a large biological molecule called the ribosome. Now, most people don't know what the ribosome is. It's funny how most people know what DNA is or think they know what DNA is. But if you tell them the ribosome, nobody's, nobody seems to have heard of it, okay, outside biology. And it turns out the ribosome is the machine that translates the information in our genes, which is in the form of DNA, but it, a copy of it gets made into a sort of working molecule called messenger RNA. And then this genetic information is read by the ribosome to make proteins. So we have thousands of genes in our body and each of those genes specifies how to make a particular protein. And it's the ribosome that actually does the translation and makes the protein. 
And it's this very large molecule. It has almost a million atoms in uh, bacteria and even more in, higher, you know, almost double in higher organisms. And nobody had any idea what it looked like. And it's a little bit like trying to understand how a car works without knowing how it's put together, okay? You might know that it takes in uh, g gasoline and emits carbon dioxide and water, but that's all you'd know. You'd, you wouldn't really understand how it worked unless you knew uh, what the inside of it, how it was constructed. So that was a big problem. And uh, there were two professors at Yale, Peter Moore and Don Engelman, who had written an article in Scientific American about trying to locate the different proteins on the ribosome. Now, the ribosome is interesting because it's a machine that makes proteins, but itself is made of RNA and proteins. And the question is, where did it come from? Well, Francis Crick had the first real idea about this. He said, well, maybe early ribosomes consisted just of RNA. And that was a world, it may have come out of a world before DNA even existed, okay? People think DNA was the last thing to emerge, uh, and there, were f there was RNA and proteins first before DNA uh, even got going. And it turned out to be a useful storage medium, and that's why it, um, it, it became prevalent. So there was this article, and one of them, Don Engelman, was the other person who had written to me asking me if I would be interested in a postdoc. So I wrote to him and I said, well, you know, you were interested in me before I knew any biology. Now I actually know quite a bit of biology, so maybe you'll be even more interested in me. And uh, I said, I'm interested in membrane proteins because I was working in a membrane protein lab. These are proteins that sit in the cell membrane. Often they're channels that allow things to go in and out of the membrane. Often they're signaling molecules. They sense things from outside and then send signals inside the cell. Anyway, they're incredibly important uh, molecules. And Don said, well, I don't have any money to work on membrane proteins, but we do have an opening for a postdoc to work on this ribosome project. And uh, my colleague, Peter Moore, will be in San Diego and he'll, he, you know, if you want, he, he'll be happy to meet you. So I met Peter Moore. Uh, he's a very reserved, um, you know, sort of very straightforward kind of guy. And I wasn't sure how the interview had gone, but it, in the end, I got a letter from him saying he'd be happy to have me visit Yale. And I visited Yale and found out that they were okay with me. And, and th there I was. So then I went to Peter Moore's lab at Yale. So now I've gone from Ohio all the way to California, you know, and I drove a rider truck to California with all our belongings about two weeks after our son was born. And that was quite an interesting uh, experience. And now I had to go all the way to the other side of the country again, to the East Coast. So I've been crisscrossing across the U United States. I went to Yale and for four years worked on this project on the, on the ribosome. And, you know, it was a little bit like stamp collecting. I was, you know, you, you had to locate one protein, then you had to locate the next one, and you had to locate the next one, and so on. And in the end, I'd located about a third of the proteins in the what is called the small subunit of the ribosome. Now, after f three years of this, Don said, look, you know, you need to look for a job because, you know, it's, it's only in your own interest to move on. And uh, so I said, I, I, thought I hadn't quite given it that thought. And I said, okay, sure. Now, at this point, I decided to apply for jobs. And I looked, I was reading science and nature religiously from back to front, as they say, because in the back were all the classified ads for the you know, job openings. And uh, I, I applied to every single opening that I could even remotely be qualified for. And they ranged from uh, four-year colleges. America has excellent four-year colleges. These are primarily undergraduate, research, uh, undergraduate teaching institutions which give you an undergraduate degree. You can do a little bit of research, but it's not a high-powered research place. And that, but oddly enough, many more people from these colleges go on and, to become scientists than actually people from, who graduate from you know, Harvard or Yale or 
uh, places like that. So it's an interesting phenomenon. So I applied to those places. I applied to, you know, state universities. These are, you know, funded by various states like, you know, the University of Tennessee or the University of Kansas, etc. And then I applied to sort of high-powered research universities. And so I applied to 50 universities and I got exactly zero interviews, okay? And the reason is, you can, you can just imagine the, the sort of how my applications would have been received. The Fourier colleges who want, you know, someone who's very eloquent, who can be a good teacher, etc., gets an application from a guy with a long and to them unpronounceable name from India, okay? <coughs> who's been to sort of physics and then he's sort of switched into biology and they have no idea what to make of it. What, what is he actually going to teach, okay? And can he even speak English properly? That was another uh, question they might have had, okay? Not realizing that I uh, actually went to an English school in India. So that's one part. And then the research university said, well, this guy's trained in physics at a, you know, sort of second or third tier university. It's not university that's very uh, high up in the research uh, league and um, you know he's trained in physics you know his PhD in paper in physics is you know we don't know what to make of it and he's published a bunch of sort of solid but you know not earth-shattering papers uh, from his postdoc and clearly he's sort of not in the top tier okay so I can hardly blame them now of course, at the time, you know, it was sort of devastating because I'd already changed careers once and I felt like my second career was also going to go down the tubes. And uh, fortunately, uh, Don Engelman called a neutron scattering facility in Oak Ridge National Lab and asked, you know, told them about me. And they were looking for a biologist to interface with their neutron scattering machine. So they wanted me to run the biological experiments on the machine, talk to biologists, and encourage them to use this machine. I didn't have any options, so that's where I went, okay? And the understanding was that I'd be able to do my own research, but I could uh, do the service job uh, as well. But I could do my own research uh, some part of the time. But when I went there, I was told that I couldn't actually do my own research. There was no facilities, no lab equipped, uh, equipment in the lab, nothing. And when I told the guy, he wasn't very sympathetic. He said, look, we hired you here to run the neutron facility, help run the neutron facility. So about three months after I got there and had bought a house, I was on the job market again. And this time I got a job at another national lab called Brookhaven National Lab. And there, they also wanted me to do neutron scattering, but they said, we don't care if you do your own research, we're happy for you to do what you want. And uh, so I ended up working there, I did a bunch of neutron experiments, and they came to, it came time to give me tenure, and they said, well, what will you do if we give you tenure? I said, well, if, I, if you give me tenure, the first thing I'm gonna do is go away on sabbatical. And they said, really, why? And I said, because I want to learn crystallography, because I don't think neutron scattering is a very useful technique for biology, but with X-ray crystallography, you can get a detailed atomic structure of biological molecules, and that's a key to understanding how they work, and everybody will be interested if you solve a structure of a protein, because it'll tell you how things work. So this, to my, you know, pleasant, not surprise, but I was, you know, pleased that they, they bought it, and they gave me tenure, and you know, I went off to learn crystallography. And the place I decided to go was to uh, the MRC Lab of Molecular Biology in, in Cambridge. And the reason was that was a place that lots of people had, first of all, lots of Americans had gone there and done very well. You know, Tom Stites, uh, Peter Moore, all these people at Yale had gone to the MRC Lab. And it was very famous because it was a place that founded uh, X-ray crystallography of proteins uh, by Max Perutz and John Kendrew, you know, Francis Crick uh, worked there. It had a long track record of really important science. And it had culture, it has a still has a unique culture of very small groups 
working on really important problems and often the group leaders are actually doing lab work instead of sitting in their office, things like that. So I decided to uh, write to Aaron Klug, who was the director at the time, and he uh, allowed me to come there on sabbatical. He made arrangements for me to get a Guggenheim Fellowship. So I came there, worked there. When I went back, I wasn't so happy about the way Brookhaven was developing. The Department of Energy that ran Brookhaven wanted to support large facilities and not allow individual biologists to do their thing. So I went off to the University of Utah for a few years. And because Utah had a, a lot of people working on RNA biology and had a very vibrant group of young scientists, many of them are now members of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, one of them, Mario Capecchi, went, off, went on to win the Nobel Prize for showing how you could insert genes in a targeted way, uh, you know, to do in a, you know, sort of a recombinant uh, DNA technology applied to mammals. So um, the reason I left Utah was I wanted to work on the structure of the whole ribosome. And there was a group in Germany headed by Ada Jonat uh, who had been working on this problem for a very long time, but progress on the, on the problem had stalled. And I had some new ideas of how to go about it. But I didn't know how long it would take me to get crystals. And I also thought, even if I got crystals, I didn't know if my ideas would work. And in a university system, your research is funded by grants. And these grants are typically you know, somewhere between three and five years. And so if you, ha if you don't have results after three or four years, then you know, what do you do for your next grant or for your renewal? They'll say, well, we gave you this money and you haven't done anything with it. And you know, then you're in, in real trouble. And often people fall off the edge at universities. These are people, you know, they don't like to talk about them. Uh, and then, you know, often they end up doing a lot of teaching, which is a worthwhile activity, but sometimes there's no job for them and they, they're, you know, forced out. So that is a, a serious problem. So on the other hand, I felt the LMB had a long track record of tackling very hard problems. And also they had a culture where they allowed you to focus on the problems there were colleagues there who would sort of tell you when they thought things were working and when it might be time to change tack. And, if, and it's a place where per perhaps you're allowed to fail once, you know. So you could, you know, if things didn't work out, you could uh, try other things and, you know. So anyway, um, <clears throat> so I wrote to the LMB again, to Richard Henderson, who was then the director, and asked him, uh, you know, how about if I come to the LMB and work on the ribosome. And I visited the LMB and we had a long chat and there wasn't any space and in the end uh, space became available. And then I really had to make a hard decision because by this time our grown children uh, were in the US. They're obviously not going to move to England with us. And so my wife and I had to, would have to move and I'd have to take a 40% salary cut which combined with the cost of living in England was probably more than half in terms of a salary cut. But in the end, I, I figured, you know, most scientists don't actually need all the salary they're making anyway because they're spending all their time, time in the lab. And, you know, and okay, you want to go to an occasional movie or something, it doesn't cost a lot. So, so uh, you know, so ultimately, you know, you want to make sure that most of your waking hours are happy, not the occasional vacations you take. So, um, uh, you know, so I decided, well, you know, uh, I, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. There's probably a narrow window in which to do the ribosome. And so I, you know, my wife, luckily uh, for me, agreed yet again to move. I mean, you know, you have to realize these kinds of things, if you're in a partnership, you know, it requires two people to agree. And, you know, I'd, my wife had sort of moved all, over, all around the country with me. So I really do owe her a great deal, uh, you know, for um, supporting my career. And uh, so anyway, we took off to the LMB and um, 
but even before we reached the LMB, we had already made the initial breakthroughs in Utah. And two of my people moved from Utah, uh, the pe people who had, including the student who had started the project. And um, uh, after that, uh, things sort of, there was a very tense year with an intense race, but that's probably a story best left. Uh, somebody ought to write a, a book about it um, because it does have all these aspects of a scientific race and what that does to people. And uh, anyway, um, in the end, it all worked out. And uh, one thing led to another. And uh, one day, I, um, long after I'd given up on the possibility, uh, I was um, going off to work and I uh, got a puncture halfway, annoyingly halfway, because it, it meant I was about, it was the furthest distance to walk, either to home or to work. And I ended up coming to work late the phone rang and somebody said, you know, this is a Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and uh, we have an important, you know, th there's something important we would like to talk to you about. And I immediately thought it was a prank because, you know, I had long given up on the idea of, the, of a Nobel Prize for, uh, for, to me, for various reasons. And uh, anyway, it turned out to be true. And... Uh, <laughs> The, but, but, and, the, and the thing is, there's one, one very interesting thing that happened, and that is Gunnar von Heine, who was you know, one of the high ups in the uh, Academy of Sciences, said, you have two choices. You, know, you can be like Rod McKinnon, who had won the Nobel Prize a few years earlier at Rockefeller, and had not let it distract him at all, and just kept on doing his work, okay? Uh, or you can, you know, uh, so use this thing. Now, I got it in my 50s, so people still want, expected me to do more science, you know. People, many people get it in their late 60s or 70s, and they can sort of write it out, you know, go take one invitation after another and, you know, be wined and dined all over the world, accept honorary degrees, uh, you know, stuff like that. And I realized, you know, I, that's not the sort of thing I wanted to do. And, if you, if you go to PubMed, you'll find that my track record after 2009 is at least as good as the sort of seven or eight years before 2009. Actually, probably better in terms of number of important, uh, you know, papers published. So, uh, you know, it, it takes a certain willpower to say no and uh, stick to primarily to science. And because you have to remember, what is it you're you know, the Nobel Prize is not an end. It's simply a recognition of your achievement. It's not an, you know, end, you know, goal of a, a scientist. So you have to ask, what, is, what are you doing science for? And it, it is to sort of understand things, uh, you know, better or understand new things. So, uh, and that lasted until uh, sort of late uh, 2014. And then, to my great surprise, uh, I was asked if I would consider becoming the next president of the Royal Society. And that was something I really couldn't say no to. First of all, it was a great honor. Uh, you know, if you look at who uh, past presidents have been, it's really a very uh, <coughs> distinguished list. And I'm, I felt incredibly flattered to ask if I would want to join that, uh, that, those ra the rank of those people. And the ranks of those people. And then, of course, you know, I also realized there were other issues. One is, um, you know, science is, is something that really does need nurturing. And, and British, Britain had been very good to me in terms of supporting my science. And I felt it was a chance to give back to the British science community and really help nurture uh, British science. And there, is, there was also a personal thing. I was an immigrant uh, to Britain, and I'd done well. And it did send a signal to the society at large that, look, immigrants can come here and do really well and contribute to British society. And you know, in the current debate, that is actually a very important uh, point to make. So I accepted the presidency of the Royal Society, and that really has um, 
taken up quite a bit of my time in a way that the Nobel Prize uh, didn't, uh, because it is real work and uh, it's not. Once you accept the job, you, you know you you are you know you've taken on a responsibility uh, to go out there and provide leadership. So I'll stop there and take questions and. Perhaps we can have a discussion. Great. So if you would uh, like to ask a question, then uh, please wait for the uh, microphone to reach you. It's only a recording microphone, so it won't amplify your voice. So yeah, do we, do we have any volunteers to kick us off with some questions? Don't all bite at once. Yeah, on the, at the end of the row there. Hey, so you briefly mentioned immigration. Um, what would you say to young scientists in the UK who are kind of uh, concerned about the future of science and the kind of political climate of hostility towards it at the moment and who are perhaps considering moving abroad long term? Yeah, so um, I have several views on that. First is, the first thing you have to realise is that if you poll those people who very strongly supported Brexit you'll find that they're not against mobility for skilled uh, workers, f such as scientists, you know, doctors, nurses, etc. So I think mobility for, sk for skilled workers um, is, is something accepted across the political spectrum. Now, having said that, one of the strengths of Britain has always been that it's been very open. It's, it's the second largest destination for international science, second only to the US, which is, you know, four or five times bigger, okay? And, and that's one of the strengths of British science. If you look at, let's say, the president of the Royal Society, three of the last five presidents were born abroad, okay? And a sixth was the son of immigrants. So that just goes to show you uh, how, you know, immigrants contribute and enrich uh, British science. There is, however, a problem of perception. What Brexit has done is created a perception that, you know, Britain is hostile to and not welcoming, you know, to talent, etc. And I think it's very important for the government to change that perception. And one thing that I feel the government ought to do is the first thing that they ought to do, the new government, whichever uh, that is, is to ensure that EU citizens who are already here uh, are allowed to remain. If the negotiations prove difficult, I think they need to just unilaterally uh, say, look, we're going to allow them to remain, and these are our, our conditions. You know? and, and I think that would reassure a lot of people that it's not about you know, immigration, etc. It's more about taking control over immigration rather than being anti-immigration. And beyond that, they need to change perception. They need to constantly reinforce the message that, look, immigrants come here, they do very well, they become <coughs> directors of institutes, CEOs of companies, or presidents of the Royal Society. Uh, you know, those are all examples that they can use to show that once you're here, you know, it is a welcoming uh, environment. Yeah, the gentleman just on the second row there. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. So the first one I'm sure you got before as well is, how do you decide what you want to do? In your case, as you said, you wanted to do plasma, uh, the membrane proteins, but the funding was available for ribosome, and you started doing that. For a young scientists, what would you advise? How should one select a topic? Secondly, yeah. as president of the Royal Society, I think there's a lot of opportunities uh, recently for clinician scientists over people who've just done their PhDs. Do you think that's an important aspect of science, that there should be more involvement of clinician scientists rather than just scientists? Is that the right way to go move forward? You mean have more clinician scientists? More clinician scientists, or the other way around. <coughs> okay, so th let me come to your first problem uh, question first. So the choice of a problem is, can be pretty random. For example, you could argue it was completely a random event that I went into work on the ribosome. But you have to realize it wasn't completely random. In, the, in other words, I already knew that the ribosome was absolutely fundamental to life. You know, it's the thing that takes, takes you from genes 
to what the gene is specif specifying, okay? It's at the crossroads of, bio of molecular biology. So I wouldn't have gone into it if I didn't think it was an interesting and important problem. So I think the real thing is that you may not be able to choose a problem necessarily, although you, you ought to get that chance later in life. Certainly as a grad student, you might be able to get, uh, you'll have more of a choice. But it's always important to do something you really think is interesting. And part of the reason is that in science, you know, I'd say 95 or possibly 98% of the time, it's pretty tedious drudgery, okay? Uh, you're either doing lots of calculations or you're doing lots of experiments, and the experiments are not working. And when they work, you write it up and you publish, and then again, things are not working. So the actual amount of time when things are working is pretty small, okay, because they work and then you publish, okay? So you have to, so it only works because you care about the question. If you don't care about the question, you really should be doing something else. Now about clinician scientist versus basic scientist, I'm not sure what the right ratio is, but I do think it's important to have a minimal number of clinician scientists because there are people who understand both the clinical aspects of science and also know how to do science and what research involves. So, and America is particularly good at this because they have MD-PhD programs and uh, that's happening more in Britain now, but I think we need more of that. Sure, let's take another question. Yeah, at the, the middle there on the end of the row. Um, did you ever seriously think about quitting science? And if so, what do you, what do you think you would, you would have done? Yeah, a absolutely. I think there were several times. So, so actually, I, I even applied to medical school when I was uh, thinking of leaving physics. Instead of doing a PhD, I thought maybe I'll do an MD and get into biology that way. But when I only got one interview, but when the interviewee found out that I really was keen on research and really wasn't so interested in clinical work, I mean, she quite naturally didn't uh, give me a place. So that was one option. But all through the rest of my career in biology, I never knew if things were going to work out. And so one back, so I had, you know, a plan B and a plan C, possibly even a plan D. You know, plan B possibly was to do, go and do computer programming, go to Silicon Valley and become a computer programmer because this was the 70s and Silicon Valley was booming and I might, might be a billionaire today if I'd done that, okay? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and I was one of the few people who knew how to program in those days, you know, so that was one thing. Another thing was I contemplated seriously if things didn't work out that I would become a high school science and math teacher uh, because although four-year colleges had rejected me, there was a big demand for properly qualified uh, high school teachers and that's still the case unfortunately uh, and both in Britain and in the US. And I have to be honest with you, if I had gone into a, been a high school math teacher or a science teacher, I would have been perfectly happy. Okay, it's a very important and rewarding, uh, you know, can be rewarding profession. After all, you're training the next generation of, uh, of people in science and math. So I think it's very important to have alternative plans because you never know if things are going to work out. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. you're at the end of the row there. Thanks very much. Um, for those of you who don't know Venki, um, he's in, um, he, is, uh, he utilized his uh, strength in physics um, uh, to, to, to address some fundamental biological question. And the structural biology techniques, um, for example, X-ray crystallography and cryo-EM, they, they solely rely on uh, a lot of physics and calculations and programming and stuff. And so he is really a truly, he's truly an interdisciplinary scientist. Um, my question to Venki is that, uh, what do you think about the most important um, structural biology question in the present context? <coughs> well, cryo-EM, which you alluded to, is a, is a technique that's been around for a long time, but that's undergone a revolution due to technical advances uh, in the last few years. 
to a point where you no longer need crystals to determine structures of very large complexes uh, to get an atomic structure. I mean, even in 2013, people would have thought this was impossible. So it really is quite recent. But what this means is you can do ever larger complexes. And this means you can actually look at things in the context of how they are in the cell. And so I would say in structural biology, some of the most exciting thing is going to be how molecules are organized in cells. And doing that at a level where you can see, you know, molecular details. Uh, because it's not clear that the cell you know, we don't understand the s sort of supra-organization inside cells and what, how things work. Uh, we know about molecules, we know broadly about large structures in cells, but bridging the gap between molecules and cells is, I think, going to be a, a big area. And it'll dramatically change our understanding of how cells work. Great, let's take another question. Yeah, just at the end of this row here. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you alluded to the scientific race uh, you had just before you made the discovery of the ribosome. Can you elaborate uh, a bit on that? And also, you worked in many different uh, scientific environments, and people often forget the interpersonal aspect of working in different research groups. So how did you find with dealing the interpersonal relationships in high-pressure scientific <coughs> contexts? Yeah. So, um, so the, 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 the problem with the ribosome was that um, Ada Yonat, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize, had obtained the first crystals when she worked with Heinz Gunther Wittmann uh, around 1980. The first report was in uh, 1980. And then it took about a decade of effort uh, on the part of their group uh, to go from the initial crystals of the large subunit that didn't diffract very well to a large subunit crystal that uh, really diffracted to atomic resolution, to three angstroms, so you could determine, in principle, you could determine an atomic structure. And then, you know, things sort of stalled. And uh, I think the field felt, you know, there was a need for new ideas and possibly competition. Now, people often ask, you know, why don't scientists just collaborate and why, not, why do they compete? And this is always an interesting question. Sometimes they collaborate and compete at the same time. And sometimes competition is collaboration in the sense what happens is you're competing, but you have to publish your results, okay, in order to get any credit. As soon as you publish your results, your ideas are used by other people. So you're sort of collaborating even against your will, if you like, you know. So science is really all collaboration and competition at the same time, very much like life, you know, in, in other aspects of life, we're also collaborating and competing at the same time. Another thing that I, I would say about this is competition is very good for science because it forces people to work efficiently, work very hard, and also think hard. That's the hardest part is to think hard and really think through your ideas because if you have competition, you know you have no time to lose. So you really want to make sure you're doing the right thing. So competition is good for science. It's really terrible for scientists because, you know, it's very stressful. It's especially stressful for students and postdocs. And, uh, you know, the, my, my wife often would, you know, in the middle of these, some of these uh, things, would say, I, I would tell her I'm terribly worried about being scooped. She once asked me, what do you mean being scooped? And I said, you know, you're not a newspaper reporter. And I said, well, you know, it's where somebody else is doing, you know, working on the same thing and they might publish before you. And she said, well, why don't you do something original? And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, of course, you know, we all like to do something really that no one else is doing uh, if we could. But usually those things are not very interesting. And if it's very interesting, often there are other people who are also interested in it. It's very rare that you can find something that's truly interesting and important that no one else has thought of, okay? And if you do that, then of course you really are the big pioneer and leader in that field. So anyway, so this ended up, you know, and I started working on the small subunit, which at the time uh, didn't have very good crystals. Uh, and 
so I thought it would be a little niche and I wouldn't have to compete head to head. The Yale group uh, really worked on the large subunit in a sort of what would have been a head to head competition. But in the end, to my rather, uh, sh to, the sh to my shock at the time, I found that, uh, you know, Ada Yonat had switched her attention from the large subunit to the small subunit because she had found a condition in, under which the small subunit also diffracted well. And so now I had to make a decision whether to continue competing and then I would have to compete or whether I should, you know, drop out. But by that time we had too much invested in it and I'd really thought through how to actually solve it. And uh, so it ended up being this really tense three-way race, really two-way if you l looked at the small subunit, but three-way if you thought of getting the first atomic structure of anything to do with the ribosome. And, uh, and then there was a fourth group that was working on the entire ribosome, uh, but that those crystals didn't diffract as well. So they, to, in order to build a molecular model, they needed the atomic structures of the two subunits that uh, you know, the Stites group and we had solved. Uh, in the end, uh, it all worked out. We all got credit for it and, you know, so, uh, you know, it, it, it's okay. But at the time, it was not at all pleasant. And it brings out the, it brings out the best and the worst in people. Great. Let's have another question. Yeah, from the gentleman there. Thank you so much for your talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, I just wanted to have a quick, uh, ask you a quick question. You faced so many setbacks in your life again and again and again, and now you're sitting as the president of the Royal uh, Society. What forced you to stand back up again and again and again? I think what, a, you know, as I told you, I always had a plan B and C, uh, but I didn't want to resort to plan B and C until it became absolutely necessary. So if you look at each of my steps, it's really keeping my options open. So, you know, physics didn't quite work out. Okay, but I really was interested in science and wanted to do research, so I thought, okay, I'll try starting again. So it's really keeping your options open. And then, you know, going to, uh, you know, then I was doing this sort of dead-end technique called neutron scattering. I thought, well, actually, this isn't gonna do very much for me. So you know, I went off and learned crystallography, you know. So it's a way of keeping your options open and renewing, you know, y your, yourself. So a at the time, you know, it, didn't, it just seemed like it was the next thing to do. I, I don't think I fretted as much about it as I might now, you know. I think, that, I think when you're young, you're bolder and, and just, you know, things don't seem quite so, so hard when you're young. Take another question. Yeah, at the very back there, the end of the row. Hi, thanks very much for your talk. I was wondering if you could um, make a couple of comments about being an effective leader in a scientific community and specifically getting the most out of a team. I think that's something that's probably a bit underdone with scientists, but you mean the leader of a research team? Yeah, yeah. Particularly, yeah. I mean, as you mentioned it, you said it's, it's very important to think hard <coughs> yeah. about what you're trying to do so you don't waste time. I think also optimizing the performance of your team yeah. is, is equally important. So I'll, I'll start off with a, a, a slight joke, but it's not actually. And that is, you know, when my, in response to, you know, my various sort of awards and things, uh, one day my wife said, you know, you've only done all this because you've just, hired a bunch of smart people uh, to do all the work. And uh, there's some truth to that, actually, you know. And uh, so the first thing you have to do is when you assemble a group, you have to hire people who are really talented and interested in the problem, but you'll only be able to attract them if you give them freedom, okay? And so you cannot try to be a micromanager if you want really talented people. Okay, you've got to come, th get them to your lab, give them some freedom, don't sort of lean over their shoulder and constantly, you know, tell them what to do. You know, let them, you know, give them leeway and, you know, le let them, you know, flourish and develop. So that's one thing. The, uh, uh, so it's very important to have people around you who are, you know, 
as good as you or, or hopefully better. The other thing I learned is something that the LMB practices, but many universities don't, uh, which is to limit group size to a very small number. Uh, this, this has several effects. First of all, communication is much better within a small group. Okay, and So everybody knows what everybody else is doing. Ideas flow back and forth much more easily. Uh, and you know, problems get solved much more easily. That's one thing. It, it creates a better and more collegial atmosphere. And they're not all jockeying for position in some big hierarchy. The second advantage is, if you have a small group, you can't do everything. It means you're forced to think of what's the most interesting problem in this field. What do I want to spend my limited resources on? Rather than if I have uh, 30 people, I'll just try and do this, that, and the other. And, you know, and, and, and the problem with doing lots of different things in a large group is every one of those things takes time and takes effort. You have to write the paper. You have to make sure that student graduates or the postdoc gets a job. Okay? It all takes time. And it takes time away from the two or three things that you really care about. And nobody has more than two or three things that they really care about. Uh, you know, I don't believe it, you know, because it's hard enough to think of one great idea. And you know, two or three would be really an abundance of riches. OK, so. Great. We've got time for one or two more questions. OK, yeah, gentleman just here. I would like to ask you two questions, if, if I may. Um, first of all, you took us up to 2014, and then you sort of stopped the story. I would be curious what happened. Like, what, what are the issues that you, you're busy with, that you fill your days with nowadays? Does your wife see you more or less? And also, the second question is, um, what kind of hobbies do you have? What kind of hobbies? Oh, OK. Yeah, no, they're very good question. So let's, let's talk about the first thing. So here I am. A, a guy who immigrated here relatively late in life and parachuted into the LMB, which is a bit of a, uh, an island anyway, you know, because it's an institute that's not close to the rest of the university uh, campus. It's on the Addenbrooke's Hospital site, right? And anyway, once I come here, I'm totally focused on the ribosome. Suddenly, I get asked if I want to be president of the Royal Society, okay? And I'm not a guy who grew up here and has lots of networks and uh, things like that, okay? So it's been a steep learning curve for me, okay? I've, I have to understand how British institutions work, etc. Six months after I sort of take over, Britain has a referendum and decides to leave the EU, okay? And this has tremendous consequences for science because a lot of our science is very closely integrated with, with the EU. I mean, we have a lot of science that is intrinsically British, but a good fraction of it is integrated with the EU. More importantly, the mobility question, you know, where we attract a large pool of talent from the EU is, suddenly becomes an issue. The EU citizens who are part of our scientific uh, you know, enterprise, you know, they're suddenly feeling, wait a minute, we thought this was just another part of our European home, and suddenly we're considered foreigners. You know, that's not psychologically, uh, must have been very difficult for them, and probably, still, and probably still is. So these are, so how do we engage, how do we, you know, advise the British government what's, what the science community wants as we get out of the EU, how to preserve links with the EU, and more importantly, how do we develop links with the rest of the world as we go forward. You know, the US is still one of our largest collaborators. So those are sort of things on the, you know, Brexit international front, maintaining our links with the EU, developing ties with, you know, other parts of the world and so on. Uh, another question that, that I have is, you know, science and technology is very increasingly disruptive. You know, we have machine learning. We know a lot of jobs are going to disappear. Uh, that are being done by humans are going to be done by computers, by automation. Even if we brought uh, manufacturing back to Britain in a big way, it wouldn't necessarily create the same number of jobs as it did in the past. And manufacturing is going to be largely automated. So how do we prepare a population for you know, 
uh, increasingly, the increasing pace of science and technology and the rapid disruption you know, that it entails. And this involves creating a, a population that's very well educated and very broadly educated. I think British education is far too narrow. You know, I have a nephew who moved here uh, at the A-level stage and he finds, you know, it's not that people are doing fewer subjects in greater depth, they're doing fewer subjects in less depth, okay? And so this is a, you know, we're kidding ourselves if we think, you know, we're doing really well. You know, maybe we were, you know, by the standards of 50 years ago. And I think British education needs to be much broader with everybody studies science, mathematics, and humanities all the way uh, until they go into university and possibly even at university. You know. So I think those are uh, questions. And then there's a general question of public engagement. You know, we need to not only, after all, it's taxpayers' money that's supporting science. So we need to engage the, with the public. You know, a farmer in Yorkshire or, or a truck driver needs to understand or needs to agree that it's okay to spend some of his taxes to, to support science. And actually, you know, if you talk to non-scientists, they're perfectly happy to support science. You know, science, science has great support, but we need to engage that and uh, engage with the public. And we need to not only share the excitement of science and discoveries and so on, but also talk about how science has improved lives and how uh, it may continue, to, what, what, what things it may continue to do in the future. So those are some of, some of the concerns. And hobbies. Well, I, I have lots of hobbies. For example, we like hiking, bicycling, I like reading, I like movies, music, um, you know, lots of, I, 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 think, I think a balanced life is actually very important. And it's, it's people who are only sort of wedded to their lab or wedded to their work end up, you know, you, you need t downtime, you need time to relax, to enjoy life. And it actually makes you a better worker in your real life. Picking up on your last point about engagement there, with a, with a general election on the cards in the UK and with a lot of attacks on the scientific community we've seen recently, culminating in the, uh, the March for Science that happened at the end of April, what do you think the scientific community can do more to engage specifically with policymakers <coughs> in forming yeah. their decisions? Yeah, so I would say the March for Science, I mean, Yes, of course, we all need to make the case for science. But the last few governments in Britain, the last several governments in Britain, have all been quite supportive of science. Even during austerity, they kept the science funding fixed. You know, they didn't cut the science budget. It was flat, so it eventually lost ground due to inflation. And then the new government uh, allowed science to uh, you know, Osborne's budget allowed science to rise with inflation. And, uh, you know, Hammond in his, the current chancellor in his last autumn statement announced a huge increase in science funding. So I think, you know, governments in the UK generally understand the importance of science. What we need to say is, uh, look, science takes two things. One is funding. As far as funding, We've done okay, they've all been very supportive, but we could do better because although we do okay, in fact, you know, our, some of our competitors like Germany and the US are actually supporting science to a greater degree, okay? And we need to move somewhere towards, uh, you know, parity with our nearest competitors. And what we argue is about 3% of GDP overall, and that includes both public and private spending, uh, should be uh, so sort of devoted to research, and that's what we think is a, is a good number to ensure that we continue to sort of stay at the cutting edge of uh, science. Um, I think a lot of the march for science in the U.S. was because, you know, the Trump administration adopted a set of, you know, made a set of statements doubting climate change, doubting, you know, all sorts of things, uh, you know, so. I think there uh, the issues are really different. Sure, great. Let's take one final question before we wrap up. Um, yeah, okay, at the back over there. Yeah, that's you. No, no, oh, sorry, the gentleman there. 
Hi. Uh, so, I'm uh, just wondering if you still like do any things with uh, with Indian scientists and Indian institutions. Um, yeah. So, from about 2006, <coughs> I started. So, I should say when I left India in 1971, uh, for the next 30 years, I only visited India about three times. Okay, <coughs> once every 10 years, and because I left when I was 19. I had really no connection with the Indian science community. And that changed in 2002 when I was asked to give a talk in India for the first time. And <clears throat> then I suddenly met a number of people in the Indian science community. And then a few years later, uh, I was given a visiting professorship at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And I started visiting Bangalore uh, almost every Christmas uh, was a good time to leave Cambridge and rather a nice time to be in Bangalore. And so I would, you know, give lectures and talk, talk to, you know, students and young faculty members and so on. And since then I've also visited a number of other institutions in India. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to, um, you know, engage with young Indian scientists and Indian faculty and sort of m mentor them when I visit. Um, I haven't done anything very formal recently, uh, but that's because I've been uh, quite busy. But I did visit them last year as well, you know, even though I was president of the Royal Society. Great. Well, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I think that's um, all we've got time for this afternoon. We could ask you to remain seated until our speaker leaves the room. And please join me in once again thanking Sabenki for coming along this afternoon. Thank you very much.